right, guys, welcome to Against the Grain. Uh, I have a very special guest with me today, one of my favorite coaches on the face of the planet, Nicole Weller. Um, she definitely fits in. I actually was hoping to have her on in one of the very first episodes, and um, some unforeseen circumstances happened, and I'm excited to have her on tonight. Uh, one of the things that a lot of people in our industry don't know that I know about you is that you are a little bit of a psychopath undercover psychopath <laughs> you right? nailed it. <laughs> right so she is a snack addict i know she has jumped out of planes on purpose and uh the craziest thing most people would probably take a double take at is the fact that you like teaching the teeny teeny tinies so tell us a little bit about yourself and then uh jump into that and tell us tell us why you got into that Definitely. Well, you got to go from skydiving to working with two to five year olds. So it's a good segue right there. But um, yes, you know, I started playing golf around age four, George, and uh, my dad started learning golf at the same time. So we kind of went out and I grew up on a really cool, really cool executive golf course. I wish we all had access to that uh, back up in Massachusetts and um, really nice place to get going and just kind of fell into golf. And um, my mom and dad gave me some really good opportunities. Uh, they both immigrated from Europe, so it was all kind of new for us, right? Um, never knew about college teams and this and that, so learning as they learned as well, but um, played a lot of youth golf, uh, state am, state women's golf, and then played at Wake Forest and uh, ended up with a degree in psychology, which has kind of led me into my sports psych, right? I did not know that. Yeah, the psychology part. But, I you know, I went know. to Wake thinking I was going to be the, the NBC nightly news anchor woman, like uh, for the country. And I, when I left there, I'm like, there's no way. Here's I your shot. To... I know. So <laughs> I kind of went a different route. But uh, yeah, and then I graduated from school going, gosh, what am I going to do next? I don't want to play on the tour, but um, I kind of want, I still like school. So I went into grad school at UT Knoxville and have a master's in sports psychology and motor skill learning and uh, had two really cool trips from there. When I graduated, I did one presentation at University of Ulster and one at the University of St. Andrews. So uh, really need to be able That's to cool. reject over there. Yeah. Have you been over there? I have not been over there and I'm Irish and Scottish. That's my lineage. And I've never been, I've actually never been out of the continental United States. So wow. I've been all over the country here. I love my road trips across our yeah. country, but yeah. I'm okay at home for now. Maybe one day. Yeah. Maybe one one day, day, put it on your bucket list. And of course, keeping in line with snacks, if you go over there, you're going to have to have some Cronache. It's really, really good Scottish okay. dessert. Maybe. Yeah. If I go over there, I definitely want to smack one over the hotel. You know, that's every day. Yes. Yeah. You like that picture? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I actually have been following the little executive clips of you and your dad. That has oh, been cool. a really cool little thing. Nice. That you've done storytelling. It's it's neat little digital storytelling. So thank you. Yeah, that was fun. OK. All right. So what led you into the little guys? Because so the first time I met you, I was at, it was at Sawgrass Country Club. I think you came down to North Florida and you mm -hmm. did a PGA uh, educational seminar for us. Right. And I have always been into the oddballs, so to speak, mm -hmm. okay, the outside of the box thinking, the creative thinking, and you came up there talking about what most golf professionals think can't be done, which is teaching mm -hmm. kids, you know, not only below eight years old, which is the typical threshold, right. right, that's typically what we see in the industry is eight years old and above, right, you were up there talking about toddlers, two, three, four-year-old kids, you know, how you get into this different applications of training at that age and also you talked about how you were able to build a business about that uh, around that at your club and essentially build the future membership for the junior golf programs and even to you know teens and adult membership mm -hmm. so tell us a little bit how about how you got into the teens definitely made you want to go there because that is a challenge you know i have to say it's probably started back in fifth grade when i took my first 4-h club um okay class on how to babysit and like the business of babysitting it was really cool and so I love babysitting and I loved um you know not just sitting there and giving the kids stuff to do I actually interacted with them I took them sledding we went snowboarding we did all kinds of stuff you know we played and we just we did things we just didn't sit around so I think that's where my interest to keep kids moving and engaging really started um and then at um at the landings club uh, once I got into teaching, there was their 15 years in Savannah, and they were wonderful to let me just try things, right? We had a 
youth golf leader who actually reminds me a lot of you, um, Josh <laughs> Williams. I don't know if you've ever met Josh, but uh, Josh Williams. It's a good okay, player. No, I haven't. Yeah, he's in the East chapter over there, but okay. um, he was our junior golf leader, and then it's passed to other pros, and you met, I don't know, Mike Morgan, but Jim Sykes, of course. Yeah, he Jim's a good dude. I still yeah. chat with Jim a little bit on Instagram every once in a while when yeah. I see his stuff. Shout out to Jim, very good. Yeah, good but, guy. Um, you know, I started with like uh, six, seven, eight, you know, got the older kids going, and then the four to fives, and then I actually started the two to threes. I just want, I don't know, I just fell into it. It was really really neat. And as I started going through and doing little bits and learning what I kind of did it through the school of hard knocks versus going and getting an early childhood development degree, which I think would be cool to still do. Um, But I kind of learned the ropes as I went through. And at that time, you know, I started hearing about Kate Tempesta and uh, Brendan Elliott. And then when I was with Proponent, um, Lauren put us all together for our first speech, which was really cool. So the three of us launched it at Cog Hill, and um, that was really neat to hear. Uh, Brian Elliott is point. Little Linksters, right? Little Linksters, yes. Okay. Yeah, he has wonderful things going in the Pee Wee Swing Contest, and he's down in Florida, okay. and Kate's up in New York. So Yeah, I know Kate. I know Kate. She's awesome. Oh, yes, definitely. Yeah. Is, I mean, to be able to teach in school <laughs> park and move around in schools, and uh, it's, it's pretty cool what she's doing with Birdie Basics. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, yeah. And you guys have both nailed, I think the, the secret sauce to it. And it's kind of what I specialize in is an environment, right? Mm-hmm. I built my products around how can I easily set up an environment that not only engages the student and provides a result-based constraint, right? But also gives them that measurable feedback. Mm-hmm. And you've got, let's see, I'm just thinking, let's see, Instagram, I know you've got tunnels out there. Mm-hmm. You have got play parachutes out there. You have got all kinds of cones, colors. I mean, it's the type of environment that wants to suck a kid into it, you know? And I think that's one of the missing ingredients for a lot of junior programs is that we get out there and we think that we have to necessarily go through that status quo. You know, as a PGA member, we teach PGA, posture, grip, alignment, right? Right. You might not necessarily be mentioned in any of those components, but you've got your little rubber feet tracks there and your little rubber arrows, you know? So the way that you set up an environment, it's, it, it, from my perspective, it's like a magical little place, a little play space. And you actually mentioned play a minute ago. So how important is that, not only for just the little guys, but also for all golfers? I think it is, it's it's huge. It is the main form in how kids learn. And so when I did little golf train with Dr. Patricia Donnelly, she brought the PhD aspect into our, our program that we did some years back. Um, you know, that the kids learn so visually, they learn by watching and you cannot sit there and talk to a three, four or five-year-old in most cases because they they aren't wired for that. And I think as I watch parents and grandparents teach the kids, they want to help. And that's why I wrote my book, because, you know, one, two, show your shoe is definitely more kid centric than make sure that you keep the radius and the Y straight and keep your arm there and blah, blah, blah. So um, I think, you know, as you're watching with the kids, look at an elementary school and a toddler school, a Montessori school. And if you're about to drop off your kid or grandchild at a school, what would you expect for that to be? You want them to be enchanted and their eyes open up and then go through everything. You don't want it to be like a high school setting where there's just a chair, right? And there's nothing up there. So the kids are just, they're learning about life. So if you were to start something, you know, imagine what you're doing to learn it. And, you know, they, they learn it by visual and they learn it by touching things and moving things around and wrecking all of the stations you have set up. So you have to have your pre-stations. So your stations kind of stay set. Um, But I think it's, it's important to be observant, move them around. Their attention spans are shorter. And a lot of people see that as a negative. And I'm like, but that's how it's supposed to be. So they're like, well, they don't have the attention spans I need. And I'm like, well, maybe they, you don't have the attention span that they need. So it's moving, it's shaking, it's keeping them engaged. And I do like one adult per child for my two to threes, especially. Sometimes I can get away with one extra helper for five kids with four to five. I really like having the parent there now um, just to educate them. So, you know, we're talking about TikTok swing the clock um, and not make sure that you keep your eye on the ball, right? So I, I talk to the parents through the kids and I'll say something like, 
well, kids, your parents aren't going to be able to say anything because all they can say is this. All they can do is give you a thumbs up or a thumbs middle, right? And then I want the kids, the three-year-olds, to go flip around and teach the parents. So they're out there with the tiny putters and the clubs, and you know they're doing a thumbs up for the shoe or whatever. So just a right. lot of interactiveness, you know? Right, absolutely. Yeah, you have to be able to coach them on their level. And I think that's one, one of the things, if you've got the parents involved, you know what I mean? As a parent with kids, if I hadn't, if I didn't have experience coaching, I would want to know how to apply certain stuff. And I think that's mm -hmm. another element that gets missed out. So, you know, being able to expose the parents is crucial. Now, in terms of the aspect of play, I, I when I, I sent you the email, I told you we're going to be doing the art of exploration. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that is another one of the secret ingredients, I think, for any level of my students. It allows me to provide a margin right? Help them understand the margin for cause and effect and actually play with it. I know you're a DIY, DIYer, right? Mm -hmm. oh, so yeah. Anytime you're learning a new skill, you, you can understand it from that perspective. You can watch a DIY video for learning how to do, do a new project, mm -hmm. right? But until you actually go through the motions, own the process from start to finish and see the product and the result, you don't really gain that understanding, right? So you get that exploration Right. Mm -hmm. How do we set it up for our kids or how important is it that we set it up for our kids or our students to be able to explore in that same manner? Well, I think it is 100 percent part of how the class should be set up. Um, you know, you're, you're thinking about ways to let them get the answer, which is, you know, I'm, I'm more of a Socratic style teacher. I know some people are like, just tell me how to do it. I'm like, well, I don't know how to tell you. We got to figure out what it means. And I had Dr. Robert Bjork come in um, to chat with our members at the Landings Club. And I'll never forget him, you know, saying, you know, you need to end on shots you don't like, because what are you going to learn? Right. And mm -hmm. when somebody figures out what it means for them to learn versus being told how to do it, it hits home more. And, and that's what the exploration is. So mine is more of a guided, you know, I want you to pull out the answers on your own. And then Pia and Lynn from Vision 54, and they're the same way. They're so good at that. You know, they provide and we provide as teachers the the setup so that you can actually figure it out on your own. So with the kids, you know, for putting, we'll start out with like I use a Rollerama from Snag or Short Golf and they'll do some putts. But then I have like all of the stuff set up and they can go around like a carnival and they can figure out with arrows and this and they do what they want. So they want to do this game or that game or what suits their eye. So um, I think that's really key to give some options and ask the questions and let them find the answers. And I ask parents to do that. You know, I'll say, hey, you know, put the club upside down and hold it weird and go, what's wrong with this? Something doesn't feel right. And so I really want the kids to be able to help with that, you know, in the education themselves and then figure out from different choices what it means. But, you know, when the light bulb goes off and it's like, oh, that is so good and all the feelings are great and they're getting it. And that's why we do that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and I tend to ask a lot of questions early on in my career. It was that, blah, blah, blah. you know, you spit a lot of stuff out. Now it's like, well, how do I guide their thinking? Like you're saying, I don't want to be a GPS necessarily. You know, I don't want to keep them. Oh. I want to be more of a compass. Right. I want to let them kind of figure out the direction and make sure they stay in those boundaries and let them find their own way. Now, you talked about that in perspective of little kids. OK, I know you teach you teach adults, mm -hmm. right? The older crowd as well. I assume. Mm -hmm. How important is it that you add that aspect into their training? Same, the same. Um, in fact, where I am now at Compass Point, it's mostly adults. Um, I actually have a, a, a youngster's lesson, a 15-year-old on Saturday, so I'm excited. And I'm helping Matt Gordon with some two to three-year-olds at Magnolia Green. So, I'm, you know, in a new place, you're kind of feeling where everything is, but we have mostly adults at our facility. So, but the for same now, exact things. I'm sorry? For now. For now, yes. You've only yeah, been there for, are you, you, been, you haven't been there a year yet, right? No, half a year. Yeah, I moved there right. end, of, end, of the, end of spring, early summer. So, so now the magnet, that magnetic field that draws all the little kids is there. So for now. Yes. Yeah, it's, we'll have to figure out how to get them there. We're kind of on the outskirts, but it's been cool. And starting to work with a couple of grandkids when they're in town. Um, but yeah, I think it's it's pretty pretty key to, to have them uh, figure out things as well. In fact, I've had, parents and people go like, oh, I like your book. I really like that one to show your shoe. I'm going to use it. So I set up a lot of the same games for the, for the uh, adults. I use this wonderful product by uh, 
Roy Boy Golf. It's uh, George Roy Golf there. now. George Roy Golf. Thank you. I'm so, old. I have so much. You'll see. Are you going to be at the show? I can't make it this year. No, I'm yeah, going to be at the um, Super Show in Greensboro, though. Okay. Well, I've got some new product. I've got so the speed straps are coming back out. You saw the colors. We're going to love be going the with speed the... straps. Love tic tac putt. Yeah. Okay. Tic tac toe the manufacturer. I found out that it takes six seamstresses to sew that 12 by 12 grid together. They have to work wow. on it at the same time. The manufacturer has declined oh. to continue making that product, but I have something in the wings that I'm working okay. on. Gotcha. It's going to be even better. So, um, but the speed straps will actually be hopefully two months. I'll have those ready for this season. Yeah. And I've got, uh, I've got something else actually that's actually in stock, but I'm waiting for the show to put it on the website. Ooh, so. Nice. Yes. I'll, yeah. I'll demo it and get it out there too. But I, I use that product all the time with the adults. So we were doing, you know, a tic-tac putt. I like to rotate around. I do the speed straps a lot. We have so many contests with that. So kudos awesome. to you. I remember when you came up to the landings and Jim and I were testing all that out, but love yeah, using Jim did it. Pretty good. Yeah, it did pretty good. <laughs> and do you ever use your your speed straps to wear for chipping? What I'll do is I'll put them um, uh, on the chipping green, like about seven eight feet apart. So I'm trying to think, like uh, like you know, if you're chipping here and there's one here and then one here, so they have to go over the blue color on the first strap, but then they can't go past the second strap. Have you ever done okay. that? Yeah, I've done that. And what I'll do yeah. is I'll actually. Uh, so like 50 yards and in, what I like to do, because that's one of the most crucial aspects for me, it was anyways, that was what I always struggled with that 30, 40, 50 yard shot. Um, so I started using them as a grid. I take right. four straps out and lay them all horizontally together. And we would either use them as a landing zone or as where I would want the ball to finish. Mm -hmm. But if you've got four straps laid out, five zones horizontally, five yards apart, you've got a grid that's now got 20 separate four foot targets mm -hmm. within that 20, 20 foot margin, you know, mm -hmm. by square. So that was really cool, especially when you're doing that variability training and, and literally a different target, every shot, different target on a different yardage, every shot. So they're learning how to apply a different rate of acceleration, plus having to change their setup and the face angles and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Super effective. But yeah, that's one of my favorites. And actually the guys at Op 36, Seth, He's, uh, do you know Seth Thompson? No, I don't know him too well. No, I don't think so. He's one of the younger guys that joined Dot 36. I guess he was a Campbell, Campbell. Okay. Along. You know, they like to keep it, they keep it in house with all those Campbell guys. They were a really good guy, though, young guy with a creative mind. And he's talked to me about a couple different games. Like, uh, one of the good, they, they played football with it during football season. They had a way that they were, you know, passing the ball down and they had little receivers, I guess, with the putting pucks. So yeah, all that stuff is coming back. All that stuff is coming back. I'm okay. excited. To, That's to nice. It well, it's probably one of my top three teaching aids I use all the time. So I love it. Thanks. Um, I wish you were going to be at the show. I got a prototype I'm going to be showing down yeah, there. I know. And I would love, I'll make sure I get it. Over to you. I'll make yeah. sure I get it. Yeah, with everything that's been going on and uh, what's coming up next week with uh, my mom heading here, it's, uh, it's a busy time. So I'm going to have to bow out this time. But yeah, awesome. come to the super show in Carolina. Okay, I might, I might try. When is that? February twenty one to somewhere in there, nineteen twenty. Okay, that's going to be closing in on the last thirty days of when the next little Roy baby's coming into this world. So. Ah, congrats! Yeah. Yeah. You haven't seen that little Ashlyn? That's that's the looking Ashlyn, be our little girl. Nice, awesome. Be our little girl, daddy's girl. I'm a daddy's girl yeah. twice over. Now. So that's awesome. Cool. All right, so for uh, for okay. these clubs that are looking to maybe introduce something for player development. I know that it's something that maybe a lot of coaches have a stigma with because the younger kids really can, if you don't know what you're doing and don't know how to get on their level and keep them engaged, it can be very difficult, very challenging, right. very stressful, mm -hmm. especially with golf clubs. Mm -hmm. But I think that it's probably, if you can run it successfully, you're setting yourself up with a player development program that is going to have a lifespan longer than say a player development program targeted at your 12 year old because now now you have got sorry my little pop-up just popped up now you've got a program where you're developing the kids for an additional eight years their quality of game right they actually become integrated into the community right so what are some of the things that maybe you could tell a club that's interested in starting up a program that might get them over that line give them a little bit of confidence in trying something new yeah that is a good point because not it's not everybody's niche you know some people gravitate to high school or middle school and 
then Kate, Brendan, and I definitely have the younger age group that we love. So um, I would say break it into small segments. Some people, especially with the staffing they have, they like, well, we have to lump everything together. So it's going to be four to 12s. And that's, that's hard. So if you can, you know, I would keep it six and older and then do something for four to fives because a five-year-old developmentally is so different than a seven. So possibly I would go down four to five-year-olds first, and then I would go into maybe some two to three-year-olds, right? I One of the things I want to start doing is heading around the country a couple trips a year to places that want to bring me in and just maybe do like a family day and get things kicked off and then help them come up with a way to go, okay, if you're going to do a program, let's go this way. Here's an eight-week, here's a four-week, here's a 12-week things that I did at the landings, right? Um, things that I tested like with little stars over at uh, US Kids when I was there at Longleaf. Um, so definitely different ideas. Even in my book, there's like a 12 um, session program in the back if you wanted to come up with something. So one of the goals is to help people go, you know, go out and I, I love running these family days and showing them how to do it. And then you may find some volunteers, people who are retired and, um, you know, maybe we're teachers or they, they would be very good as members to help. Um, but since you have one adult per child, that's going to be helpful, right? And it's it's learning how to manage the class and how to have the safety position set up and just the verbiage. So, um, you know, I'm happy to help anyone with that. I, I'm not sure if Dr. Darnley is still doing little golf train, but we had a really cool um, training manual for two to threes and four to fives. Um, obviously Kate Tempesta has birdie basics and she has a really great program there. Um, and then, you know, my book and, and I'm, I'm about to start a little eight week program with a sticker card sheet. So when the kids come in, they'll do the little stickers. I so, saw those. Yeah. All right. Now, what are those going to be called? Why don't you go ahead and promote? Is that, so the sticker cards and is there a book? Did I just hear a book also coming with those? Well, my first book I wrote in 2011, it's called Let's Play Golf. And so right. it has points in there and it has the stickers in there. So that book, actually, the back has a 12 session program if, if one of the coaches wants to get it and actually go through the book and do the curricula from there um, based on pages and whatnot. Um, then the flashcards have that I did are the, the terms from the book and there's two of each so there's two driver pictures and two out of bounds stake pictures and two whatever finish my you know show my shoe pictures so after the kids learn the terms we put all the cards down and then play memory you know right. and find the matching pictures so that's a short burst of activity and you can take that anywhere right sure. yeah sure. well that's another one of the things that you do really well is that you don't have to just in golf stuff and if you do i mean it's it's disguised in arts and crafts right i've seen you do that kind of stuff have little activity tables set up for them to do different stuff mm -hmm. so it's not just about targeting the little guys you got to be creative just think of think like a kid right definitely keep that play mindset yeah i think that's important and I've, I've been at places where you know it's it's actually like what are you doing with all the craft stuff we want them out here golfing Right. It's almost like with TPI uh, junior, you know, why, why is my child throwing Frisbees and kicking soccer balls that they should be hitting golf balls? So, you know, cross training is, is, is important and people are involved with so many different things. I think if you can get the examples across and kids, again, they're learning, they love painting, they love coloring. And the ones who don't, you know, we may want to make a different game with athletics. So I think arts and crafts are, are definitely important. Um, and you have to kind of show the parents and show the coaches why it is, you know, so. Well, think about how vital a component visualization is to our game. Right. Right. If you can't see it, how can you possibly perform at any level? Right. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The people get so stuck on how something is supposed to be taught, right? Like I've seen parents rip their kids' hands off of the clubs and go, no, you have to do it this way. Right. And I'll say, I don't care if they're reverse gripped. I want the ball getting in the hole. I don't care if they rake it in with one hand. And sometimes parents are just very, they want them to do it the right way and have a good time and learn it. But it's just, um, it's debilitating to their learning. Right. It'd be like me having, you know, a, a person learning or is driving and I reach over and go, no, you have to do the steering wheel this way and then put my foot on their gas pedal. And they're like, well, let me do it. So, right. yeah, yeah, you got to get echoes. opportunities. Yeah, that echoes what Steve was talking about, Steve Yellen, last week. Mm -hmm. um, you know, how how the typical mindset, we, 
It could just be from generations of Golf Digest magazines and swing tips and, you know, those kind of articles that we can't always get to the heart of the issue in those short few paragraphs or on our coach's corner newsletter or whatever. And a lot of times the, the students can take those things and apply them the wrong way and actually cause a detriment to their game. And I think that's, and actually you brought up specialization. Well, you almost brought up specialization. I wanted to ask you about that as well at the young age, because that's another thing that can be a detriment, right? To our, the success of a junior's career, no matter what sport we're talking about. And a lot of parents think because of the Tiger Woods effect, right? That if I train this kid from diapers up, he's going to make it to tour or something like that. More times than not, I've seen kids just completely burn out mm -hmm. and want nothing to do with the game. Right. So you brought up TPI and then what are, what are some of the ways that I, other than just, you know, encouraging other sport, you know, how can you keep your little guys engaged while still successfully moving towards development that does work towards their golf stuff? Yeah, I, th I think it'd be really important for parents and families to get into PCA, Positive Coaching Alliance, would be a very, yeah. very good resource. In fact, I talked to Keenan on email a couple days ago because I want to add a clip that they show in the training into my presentations, and he and I were chatting a bit um, because they're so so good with what they do. Um, I, th I think you know taking the parent seminar from U.S. Kids Golf is also really good on how you can actually do things way better and way faster with the kids based on on that. So I think it's uh, it's really important for the kids to do things differently. You, you have to train um, a variety of sports, right? Like Bo, Bo knows. So a lot of different activities, but um, there's so much research on specialization. And the thing, you know, I, I like kids competing, but you know, you see five, six, seven year olds now competing and they're doing the pre-shot routines like robots and they're they're doing everything so mechanically. And they're out there practicing, they're not smiling, they're just grinding and grinding and doing so much repetitive and there's no socialization. And I think that's hard to see them go through that. Um, but in a lot of ways, we've created that with all the tournament options that are out there, you know, let's bring the five-year-old, bring the six-year-old. So um, they don't know how to handle all of that yeah. in, in a lot of ways, you know? So I think that's super important. Changing the game project, I think that was awesome. Were you at the... Youth Summit, some uh, I was maybe about four or five years ago, where um, where they were they had this really great video about um, some guy who was on a skateboard and he crashed like fifty times until he learned how to do it and he right. made it through. That was really yeah. good. So yeah, John did a great job with that. Yeah, that's cool, man. Um, Positive Coaching Alliance is one that you just mentioned that I've seen a lot of stuff from. They are uh, phenomenal mm -hmm. because uh, uh, again, parents times were different when I was a kid, you know, like oh, yeah. it was a little bit more critical. And one of the things that I, and I coach soccer now too. One of my big things is like build them up, right? If I'm going to knock them down a peg, I'm going to make sure that I build them up two pegs behind it. Right. So I want them to acknowledge what we're working on and, you know, take ownership of it. But at the same time, that account accountability comes with support. Mm -hmm. you know? So I think that's a huge thing. Um, how important for now let me phrase that a little differently because i just had a little brain fart um oh back to the specialization when from obviously speaking from from your expertise of sports psychology and years of experience here when should that specialization start to take place uh specialization honestly should start taking place closer to end of middle school early high school and I think we're seeing it. So we're seeing it in elementary school, you know, um, and I meant to mention to you, um, ADM, have you done that? The ADM training, American have, Development Model? I have not. Yeah, that would be easy to get on and do some, uh, you know, um, when you have a chance. But I'm actually going to do a little presentation at the Super Show on ADM and coaching. Um, mm -hmm. Had a really fun trip to Vegas uh, in the fall and we did some filming on uh, some education mm -hmm. videos with it. But I saw ADM, that actually, I think. Yeah, it's it's going to be really cool. So it's it's basically, you know, the the different levels, you know, zero to six, kind of like TPI, here's what happens. And then ages, you know, seven to nine or eight to 10 for girls or whatnot. It, it shows you what to do at each of the levels and how, how kids are actually wired and what they can do, right? Um, so I think that ADM training is great for parents. I mean, a lot of this came from, gosh, Olympics and the Canadian, you know, models, which they're doing wonderfully. And obviously, Annika, 
uh, came up um, from in Sweden where Pia was teaching and how their system and sport training is more holistic in a way, mm -hmm. right? So specialization honestly should not be until closer to high school. And it's just happening with so many like travel teams and the gear and the schedules and he really can't be a kid anymore. No, no, I don't think a, a lot of parents think that the travel teams are really good. And I played travel baseball and stuff and I wrestled on a traveling, you know, up and down right. the coast in tournaments and stuff. And I loved wrestling. Mm -hmm. There's not a better, if you want to teach a kid to like fight through until the bitter end, there's not a better sport on the face of the planet. If you want to teach a kid how to deal with adversity, golf is the best sport because it mm -hmm. is constant adversity and you're having constantly overcome the obstacles so that'll be my sport plug for the day for for junior sports i'm going to um, add in martial arts on that though i think that now, it's great for kids yeah i would i would throw those in with the wrestling boxing and the and the you know the jujitsu now has gotten really good and a lot of the, the stuff is, is that responsibility and self-control you know again that's been a big component of three of the, the or two of the interviews of the three that we've done so far is just holding kids accountable because right. once they have once they understand that they're being held accountable, it develops a trust, mm -hmm. right? And now they've got that personal responsibility where you're helping build them up. They want to build themselves up. So it's not just that one hour, come and see me, let me schedule you, and let's get this swing lesson over with. No, it's like, let's set a goal. What's your goal, right? Here's our roadmap to get to that goal. Here's your performance, you know, criteria. Let's keep track of it and see how you're doing. And I can hold you accountable and you can hold yourself accountable. Mm -hmm. So, you know. All right. Um, we're going to break off and get ready to get into part two. Before we do that, uh, do you have anything that you would like to promote? I know that you mentioned your cards. Do you have a website that you would like to throw? And I'll put all this stuff down in the comments too, but anything you want to let everybody know about? Sure. Uh, the books, uh, the books and the cards that I mentioned, uh, everything's on my website, NicoleWeller.com. Uh, if you're in Pinehurst, Bump and Baby carries it downtown in the village and the resort actually carries my kids book and cards and my new adult book that came out in 2011. Uh, that's out on Barnes and Noble and Amazon, but it's, it's all on my website. What is that one called? So that one's called Big Thoughts from Little Golfers. It was during COVID. I'm like, we need some good news out here, people. So in 2021, uh, I published that book, Big Thoughts from Little Golfers. And it it actually compiles all of my quotes of the day that I put okay. on Facebook. Yeah. And I put them into different sections of the book. And it's it's really, the stuff is funny, but some of it is actually very inspirational and true, what these five-year-olds say, right? And some older kids. But each section is broken down by topic. And the beginning of each section has some tips on parents. How do you work with the youngster? And mm -hmm. there's also a section on PCA in the back. So that's on there as well. All right. Very cool. I'll have to check that out. I didn't know anything about that. And I think mm -hmm. it's, that's cool. That's like a, what Bill Cosby's kids say the darndest things. Yes, I mean, yeah, it's yeah. the example, you know what I mean? Yeah. But it's amazing how profound some of those little minds can be. Oh, my gosh. Like the quotes in there. Yeah. You can't not laugh at that book. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you for coming on. We'll break and uh, I'll get back with you in about 10 minutes. Sounds good. All right. Cool. Awesome. All right. See you in a bit, George. See you.